What do you say, Zachary? Should we get going? Yep. It's yep. One past, so let's get started. Yeah, let's uh, let's go for it. So yeah, uh, thank you to all of you joining. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, welcome to this this webinar to to launch our uh, new product module, uh, the AI classifier uh, that we spent the last year or so uh, building uh, on our own, but also together with some of our key clients. And uh, we're, we're pretty excited about it. So very exciting to see so many of you here and uh, very excited uh, to, to be able to show you and uh, hopefully get some feedback from you uh, as we go. So I think the you know, even if we know many of you already, we we may not know all of you, uh, and I know for a fact that we don't know all of you because I can can see who you are. Um, probably good to to do a very very quick uh, introduction to to us and to IP Rally, uh, so that you know uh, who you're dealing with here. So my name is Andreas. Uh, I've been the chief commercial officer for IP Rally for about two years, uh, coming up to two years. Um, have a legal background uh, in IP, and uh, then after that, uh, almost 20 years in the patent software and services industry. Uh, so I've seen the, the evolution of, of technology uh, to the point where we are now, and um, I'm pretty excited that we're, we're going to be able to, to share this next step in, in the evolution with you today. So even with that said, though, um, it's no question that the star of the show is is Sakari. Uh, he is the CEO and the, the co-founder of IP Rally. And uh, he worked many years as a European patent attorney um, before he realized that what he really needed to do was to change the way we access patent information. Uh, and uh, he's been working on this for, for the past five or so years. And it has resulted in some quite unique uh, things. Um, so, uh, we'll go to the next slide, Sake. So, what what's been built uh, by Sake and the, and the other co-founders uh, in a fairly short time is is uh, something uh, quite unique, both as a company and and the product that that's attached to the company. So, company was founded in twenty eighteen. Uh, and within the first year, there was a viable product in the market and. Uh, We've been racing since. Uh, so the company has grown substantially since then. And we now have three offices and, and 30 plus employees. And our mission is very simple. Uh, we want to make technical information accessible and understandable, as you can read here. And the way we do that is by developing true deep learning, artificial intelligence, and software. Uh, to solve many of the problems that we we all face and we're familiar with if we're working in the IP space. So the AI is is called Graph AI. Uh, so it's proprietary, it's unique, and it's it's built from the ground up. Uh, and what's unique is that it, it actually understands technology and is trained to mimic the behavior of a patent professional. So it's the foundation of, of everything that we do, uh, essentially. And the way you access... Um, this artificial intelligence is through the the you know a SaaS product, uh, so you you can then use it to search and process patent information, uh, arguably more efficiently than than what's been possible before. Um, <clears throat> so initially we started from the search aspect, uh, but we have now evolved into other things as well uh, adjacent to that collaboration workflows and. Uh, Thing that we're talking about today, which is automatic classification of, of patent information. So purpose is to make your life easy and to automate as many steps as possible. Um, and what's unique about it is really the knowledge graph uh, aspect uh, where you can describe and, you know, map out and search for information using graph. Uh, and then just, um, you know, we, we've use that methodology to to make life easier and allow you to uh, to get a lot of benefits from from using that. So you'll see more of that today. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. You can go back to the agenda. It's okay. Yeah. So with what we're going to do today uh, is to very quickly just go through uh, a little bit of background. Um, 
but to be honest, spend most of the time live in the demo. Uh, if technology allows us to do it, uh, I hope it will. Uh, it worked out pretty well on the last session we had. Um, but we'll start out by talking a little bit about what patent classification is and, and why we should be doing it and what the benefits are, uh, but also then a little bit about the challenges uh, in trying to do so. Uh, both challenges for, for us uh, trying to do it, but also challenges that, that may come up when you look at building a technical solution to, to do it. Um, and at the very end, uh, we're hoping to, to have some Q&A. So uh, there are a few too many of you on the call to just open it up uh, to ask questions straight out, but there is a Q&A or questions uh, button within Zoom that you can use. Uh, so I recommend that you do that, and then we'll just save those questions to, to the end, and then uh, I'll make sure I, I collate them and ask the questions. So let's, uh, let's get going. Uh, before we get into the meat of everything, I wanted to make sure we, uh, you know, just took the pulse of, of the crowd and the audience here and see how, how many of you are actually doing patent classification at the moment, and uh, and also, you know, how, uh, how easy or difficult you find it. Um, so Staki just pulled up a, a poll. Uh, this is completely anonymous. So just go ahead and, uh, and answer it truthfully. But uh, you can read the questions there. Um, if you have a custom taxonomy for classifying patents, uh, if you classify your own portfolio, and also if you classify systematically sort of third-party patents um, using this. So we'll keep this up for another 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll look at what the results are. There are no trick questions, by the way. Uh, no wrong answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see some good traffic on my screen and I'll give you still 10 seconds because answers keep coming in and then I'll end the poll. So three, two, one, zero. Let's see what you think or do actually. Yep, now you should be able to see the results. Can you summarize Andreas? I can summarize, and I think everyone sees it, and it's it's very uh, uh, it's very telling. I think from what we expect and what we hear from from others. Um, probably a few more on this call that do have a taxonomy already. Uh, on the last call, it was uh, it's a bit more from the no, but it would be beneficial part. But definitely, uh, most companies will have something right, and most companies will also conclude and see that you know it's it's pretty resource intense and uh, it takes a lot of time or money uh, to do it uh, both when you do it internally and externally so uh, yeah pretty pretty much what what we expected but it's always interesting to see it thank you for that um so if we move to the next slide uh just to get into sort of the meat of things uh First question I would ask is, is really what, what is patent classification, just to sort of set the stage, because we all have our definitions pretty clear, and uh, we've all been using different kinds of classes and classified patent data for a very long time. Uh, I mean, IPCs and F codes and CPCs and, and ECLA codes and, and all of that is is definitely classified patent data. Um, the difference between that and what we are talking about in, in our case is that the, the general classification codes are, are universal and uh, they don't take any subjective factors into consideration. They're applied uh, systematically to, to all data, uh, but uh, they don't really necessarily match obviously what, what you're looking for. And that's really what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about patent classification that is supervised data, patent data classification, uh, where you can train our technology, our artificial intelligence to learn your unique taxonomy and then classify any data set with the same uh, or maybe even better accuracy than what a human could or would. Uh, so 
you know, essentially what we, we do is we let you use our AI to see the pattern landscape through your lens and in a way that makes sense to your business. And hopefully without spending ridiculous amounts of, of time and money. On it. So, you know, if it's so, you know, good uh, and, uh, you know, we define that, what's, uh, what's the why? Uh, why should we be doing it? And not going to spend too much time about this because I think you you already know why. Uh, most of you do it uh, already. But just to go through it very quickly, um, looking at your own internal data, it's, it's probably pretty obvious uh, what the benefits are. But applying a structure to it, uh, whether it's based on technology or product categories or, or something else, will allow you to slice and dice it and, and look at it from different angles in ways to, to allow you to find opportunities and maybe reduce some risk as well or find some, some benefits. Um, you can find overlaps uh, in technologies or redundant technology, uh, underutilized assets and so on. So it, uh, it helps you make better decisions around those things and it will definitely make reporting and, and measuring sort of success and effectiveness a lot easier. Um, same is true for uh, external data, um, using your own taxonomies to, to classify third-party data uh, will allow you to, to monitor risk and, and do benchmarking exercises and things like that um, a lot better. And uh, it will definitely give you a better perspective and to, and on, on your work. And one thing, though, that, that is not necessarily always obvious is that having your own internal taxonomies applied to any data that you work with is, is something that will make the data a lot more accessible for both professionals, but also people that may not access patent information that frequently. Um, if they can just click a button or search using their own internal product codes or, or terminology instead of using Boolean methods or um, other ways of, of, of finding the data, it, data is going to be much more accessible. Uh, and that's that's something that we hear quite a lot when we talk talk to customers. But if if it's so easy or beneficial to do it, uh, why why isn't everyone doing it? Uh, why why is it challenging the way that you described it in the poll uh, just a few minutes ago? So I think I've listed a couple of, of sort of external and internal factors that play a role in this. Um, and it, it's pretty clear. I'm, I'm probably, you know, uh, just listing some obvious things here uh, because you, you probably have a longer list of things that, that cause hurdles for you in trying to do this yourself. But just to go through a very quick uh, set of, of factors that we think play a, a pretty big role in, in, uh, you know, making it difficult to to go through uh, and and do this kind of classification is that you know the, the amount of data we all have to process is just you know increasing and increasing, and that is definitely true for patent data. And we're also blending in factors like you know geographic challenges and language challenges to you know get familiar with uh, the granularities of patents. So it makes it hard uh, from a classification of categorization perspective and you know this is also true for you know next bullet which is industry convergence you know industries are now disrupted and technologies become more and more dependent on other technologies so even if we know our own domain and have known our own domain it's usually not enough anymore you need to understand the the unknown as well and it's making it very hard to to review and categorize data in meaningful ways uh, without any assistance uh, and that's where we come in. And even if you do know your, your technology areas, we also see a trend where native technical solutions and patents are becoming more and more complex and, and granular and determining whether something is you know, part of one category and not another uh, usually requires to get down to very, very small differences in details and very granular analysis, which is hard to do efficiently. And the final one from the sort of the macro factors or external factors is that anyone that's done this for a while uh, know that while patent data is very structured, it is not necessarily very clean. And uh, if you want to do and make sense of the data, it, it needs to be clean. And it's a challenge for, for anyone that is doing this. 
Um, so if you combine that with some of the internal challenges, which essentially just comes down to time and money, uh, in my experience, uh, doing this, you know, very few would say that they have unlimited time or unlimited money. Uh, so uh, it's quite the opposite. Uh, you know, we get a lot of do more with less, and uh, it is uh, it's definitely challenging to do this uh, unless you dedicate a lot of time and a team to do it or if you outsource it and that can rack up some pretty substantial costs uh, but i think one of the things that you know is the segueing into what we're doing and what we're trying to solve here um, it is clearly uh, a labor intense process and uh, the reason it's been so manual up until now is that technology hasn't really evolved enough to to be able to assist in a meaningful way in these processes. Um, so that's what we're trying to solve. And I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Sakari, to talk a little bit more about uh, sort of the technical aspects and some of the challenges uh, that comes with that. Yep, happy to do so. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, yeah, we will spend a, quite a lot of time in the in the demo part, as Andres mentioned. But uh, first, let's dig a bit deeper into the problem itself. Uh, and uh, we kind of want to be as transparent uh, as as possible with our technology. It helps you to build build the trust into the uh, kind of AI and also also understand the product better. And and that's why we want to talk about the technology a bit. So let's get started by looking at the pictures. What do you see there? Is, is, is it is it is the wheel wheelchair or, or chair with wheels? And um, it it of course kind of depends on the uh, what you see in the pictures and whether they are relevant for you it depends of course on on what you are doing. From a pure perspective, a technical perspective, they are pretty pretty similar. They all have wheels. They all have a seat and a backrest, and they have some kind of a body that connects those, and you can sit on those and and move yourself with, with those. But but if if you're in a like actual wheelchair business, doing doing wheelchairs for for elderly people or or, or disabled people, then only the left one may be relevant for you. But if you are building those bodies for for those devices, then all of those may be relevant for you. Or if you do bearings for the wheels of the of the wheelchairs, then then maybe all of them are relevant to you. So it really depends on on the on the uh, on what you are doing. And kind of like a almost philosophical level, I think when you give this problem to the machine, the machine, first of all, it needs to understand technology very well. And, and it needs to understand it somehow objectively. And that is where our, our graph AI prior art search has been, has been trained for. We use examiner citations to do as objective, uh, like uh, novel evaluations for, for technology as possible. But when we talk about classifiers, then then the technologies or the machine should also understand that what matters to you, like from a subjective point of view. And this is where the new classifier uh, AI layer uh, kicks in, and it will be trained with with your uh, custom custom data, and then it learns the uh, second aspect. And anyone who has done patent searching uh, you, with the traditional ways, uh, you, you can know that it's really hard to build uh, search queries uh, using traditional methods that capture the relevant subject matter and, and, and bring low noise. And uh, when you are faced with the classification problem and usually huge amounts of data, then, then the problem just, just gets bigger. And uh, another example, rocking chairs. Uh, here are examples like sideways rocking chair and a rocking chair with, with, a, with a, like a pivotable uh, seat uh, mechanism. And then another rocking chair, like a chair with the loudspeakers there. You can play rock. It's like literally, it's, it's a rocking chair if you play rock music there. So all these kinds of factors, even with really simple technology, can cause like problems, noise problems in, in, in the traditional ways of, of, of um, uh, searching and classifying technology. And so, so we clearly need something better. And uh, like uh, manual, 
work, like hybrid classifiers where you combine maybe Boolean and AI and manual work. It's it's so expensive. It's un unmaintainable in, in the in the long run. And off the shelf, like semantic traditional semantic AI algorithms, they they learn the semantics well, but usually they they don't understand the technology in a in a deep level. And that's where we think that we can bring something new new to the table with the supervised graph AI. Those of you who have worked with us and have seen this uh, probably earlier, uh, just one minute, our core technology, what, what we have built is, is actually three or like this far, three different AIs, like knowledge graph building AI, which analyzes the massive amounts of patent text and, and builds these kind of knowledge graphs. And the whole purpose is to make the technology more structured, make the relational information visible, uh, both for the human and for the, for the neural network. And actually, we have converted the whole prior art space, uh, 100 million documents into this uh, graph format and trained the AI to uh, interpret those and, and do the searching. And in addition to that, we have built like a, uh, uh, using this technology, like an explain, explaining module that can also explain that why, why certain hits have been found. And now the fourth. Uh, item that we are bringing on the, on the table is the, is the custom uh, classification AI, which uses the same same technology but adds in another layer or aspect to it. And the first like benefit of this technology for these purposes is uh, was already mentioned. So so it kind of brings the uh, relational information visible and more usable for the machine. And it's also very expressive in these knowledge graphs. You have like the high level information of the technology, but also the de details uh, like uh, uh, pre-crunched uh, into, into very usable format. Uh, we believe that understanding technology is key, both to like detail level searches, like prior art searches, but also if you do like a macro level analytics, uh, the, the foundation for doing anything like that is that you have high quality uh, data, and that is uh, what we uh, what we are able to uh, bring. Uh, what kind of motivates at, at least me uh, personally to this is that there is a huge amount of like collective intelligence, both in the public domain, uh, what patent examiners are doing, what we can see in the public records, but also in, in many organizations, internal records. There are like maybe like a 20 years of history of, of like manual work, but people change, but the information is still there. And now I think this new technology can kind of make that in, take that information and make something productive out of it. And that's that's pretty cool, I think. One like technical uh, benefit of these graphs that they are very agile and very efficient to process. So so we can we can do things real time, as you will see soon in the in the demo part. And the sixth aspect was also mentioned that we can we can make them explain their their own behavior at least to some extent. So besides these graphs, I think one of the reasons why we decided to productize this classifier is that that we have a, uh, the platform is in in a, in, a, in a good shape already, and uh, and then you can integrate the classifications into, into many workflows. You will see today how I use the classification in my search workflows, or I will show how, how you can integrate it to your more competitor monitoring for workflows or or whatever uh, you are doing. And then also uh, we wouldn't have started to do this if we hadn't had like proof that it actually works. And we have done, uh, as Andros mentioned, like a, a few uh, like offline pilots with customers to see that the, the data that we can provide is valuable. And, uh, and also uh, the, the search itself kind of, when we get low no search results, it kind of proves that the AI is able to understand technology and find to the right sector. So that's also, Kind of a proof that that we can utilize it for for uh, other purposes than just searching. Very quickly, uh, some some benefits. The speed was already mentioned, uh, but it it really is like quick to get started. It it only takes a few minutes to to create your first uh, custom classifier and start using it. I will I will show that soon. Uh, 
uh, the approach is pretty data efficient so uh, like compared with the, with the, uh, some other other methods uh, a relatively low amount of training data will, will suffice you can start with uh, tens of records if you have uh, 100 records that's good if you have more that's even better uh, but anyway you get started with with a low amount of uh, data and one of the cool things is that you can when the classifications are or classification is is integrated into your workflows then you can easily like grow your database and, and the classifier algorithms learn to uh, uh, kind of continuously learn uh, better and next time you use it you get more accurate results The most common use cases that that we have heard when we have talked to our uh, our uh, customers uh, are here. Uh, the search intelligence you might not even even think that classification may work there, but I will show soon how it potentially can help. Maybe the biggest need is uh, in in classifying your uh, competitors mo competitor monitoring alerts. Uh, you get usually uh, very noisy data out of your uh, monitoring profiles, so automatically adding labels of, of relevant fields will uh, immediately make the data uh, cleaner and easier to process. And also, you can apply then automatic uh, workflows to that, so if, if a certain patent gets label X, then it's redirected to person Y in the organization for quick actions. And maybe the second biggest use case is kind of portfolio intelligence. If you want to uh, like uh, analyze your competitor's portfolio or, or benchmark your portfolio against your competitors, then you need to do some macro level analytics to it. And that's that's where we can uh, really help you. But the, but the use cases are, are many, as you know. OK, let's move to the. Uh, product itself. Uh, if you have any questions, remember to post them to the Q&A. Uh, and yeah, so first I will show you what, what tax and classifiers are on, on the product level. Uh, and then I'll do two uh, different types of, uh, of uh, uh, classifier classifiers uh, one is a multi class classifier using four different chair categories we'll stick to pretty simple technology in this uh, and then the second one will be a binary classifier so kind of yes and yes or no uh, relevant or not a classifier using a so-called gold standard data set that uh, the Tony trip someone uh, some of you may know and uh, other people in the IP domain have, have generated. It's like a manually curated uh, data set that you can use for evaluating uh, classifiers. And as we go, you will see how, how all that uh, integrates into, into workflows. So stopping that share now and sharing the product window. Here we are. Yeah, this is the landing screen that's familiar to those of you who are already using using the product. Uh, and if you are not, uh, don't worry. You will see some of the key features of IP Rally during during this uh, demo. But now we'll jump straight to the uh, classifiers. Uh, First, in, in the settings, uh, you see a new uh, classification section here, which has a subsection uh, technology tax. This is kind of the dashboard for managing your uh, taxonomy. Now I have here four uh, like sample um, categories or classes relating to, uh, for example, MEMS, uh, microelectromechanical technology and they are uh, connected to some, some patent families. You can change the colors, you can change the names, uh, you can add and, and delete uh, tax here. Then another section is AI classifiers. So these are kind of the classifier robots that have been trained for a single uh, classification task. You, you can have 
many of these. You can train a single classifier for your uh, business unit X and another one for your business unit Y. And you can train a third classifier for your overall uh, like technology areas and the fourth one for a very dedicated uh, or specific uh, uh, portfolio analysis project, for example. So it's all up to you. Now, every good ma magician shows their empty hands before starting any tricks. So I'm also deleting now all the, all the existing data here. So we get really uh, a really fresh start for, for, for the classifiers. OK, I promised to do the chairs uh, classifier. And you can start your, uh, your clocks now. Uh, it should be quite fast. First, I'm creating uh, a empty empty collection chairs uh, training set so the purpose of this collection is to contain the labeled data that represents the taxonomy and and the uh, uh, classification uh, intelligence uh, that that you want to uh, want to see the ai doing and now I'm drag and dropping an Excel file here. It contains two columns, uh, or actually it contains more, more than two columns. One column contains the publication numbers and another column contains uh, tags. And here you can see that there are field, wheelchairs, folding chairs, uh, rocking chairs and, and high chairs. And uh, each document could have multiple classes. And, and some of them uh, do here, but most of them here have only one, one class. So multi multiple uh, labels are, are allowed. Pressing next, they're found in the database. And now it's importing those. And it created the, the four uh, tags on the fly. They, they didn't uh, exit as I, as I cleaned the table. And now here we have a collection of about 900 documents uh, in, in four categories. And some of the documents are also uh, with, without any category. So if I take a look, for example, this wheelchair document has, has a wheelchair tag here. And this foldable uh, infant chair has a folding chair tag and, and so on. So this is all we need to train the classifier, some data. Uh, and some some uh, labels and training the first classifier is really quick you press the create classifier button and let's give it the name chair classifying robot and create now the documents and the labels are fed to the training system and here we have a classifier ready for use and here you can also see the uh, accuracy of, of the uh, classifier. So when we uh, train it, we leave aside a certain amount of uh, samples in the uh, training set and evaluate uh, the, the performance of the classifier using that uh, uh, test set. And now this classifier is about 90% accurate. You see the uh, precision here, which is the what portion of the predicted tax are actually uh, corrected, uh, correct tax. And you see the recall which tells that what portion of the actual tax uh, will be uh, predicted when you use this um, classifier for a similar uh, data set. And the F1 score is, is kind of a single number that tries to capture the, the accuracy of the classifier. You see also sensitivity slider here that you can use if you prefer uh, to, uh, to uh, high precision and, and lower recall then uh, so low, low noise then you move the slider to the uh, left before using the classifier if you want to capture all the uh, all the relevant documents but uh, are fine with a little bit higher noise then you move it to the right you see the numbers uh, change here uh, uh, in in real time so that helps you to set the sensitivity for your project of course it's like trial and error but it's it's really testing in practice also how it works okay the classifier now ready for use uh well 
now we need some data to use it for. I will soon do it for a, uh, for a search case, but the closest data that we have is actually here. We, we can run the classifier against the uh, training set itself to see if it's able to find something interesting there. And now it, of these 900 documents, it actually predicted a little bit more. So it thinks that 13 documents that didn't have the high chair label yet are actually high chairs and, and, and so on. And let's see, now I'm uh, going here and uh, pressing the predicted number here. It applies a, a folding chair filter to the set so we can see that which uh, folding chair tags were predicted. And when we look at this, it actually seems that, hey, it's some kind of a Batman chair with, with, the, with the folding structure. So perhaps the, the AI was correct in this case. I'll press the question mark here and convert the predicted tag into a confirmed tag. So now it's like a permanent uh, part of your database. And every time you see this uh, family somewhere, you will also see the folding chair tag there. And that's how I can, I can continue here. Uh, garden chair clearly has uh, a folding structure so let's confirm this folding chair tag and so on so it's uh, pretty pretty convenient to uh, work with the tax and you can also do batch operations here so if you see that now all the folding uh, chair tags seem to be pretty uh, accurate so you can accept them all of them at once here and if you want to reject the tax in batch operation, you can do that. So I can reject it all the all the remaining tax. And of course, every time you improve the quality of the training set or, or, or the scope of it, you can then retrain the classifier. So now I pressed the retrain button, and actually the the accuracy got uh, one unit of percentage better because of the new new data that it has. Okay, let's apply this to something more interesting, like a fresh uh, data set. And uh, now for that purpose, I'm making a simple search uh, with, the, uh, with the graph method. So I'm interested in chairs that have a seat and a backrest and a, some kind of a support. So very, very uh, generic uh, chair. And as I want to get like immediate insights uh, to my search results, I'm also setting an active classifier here. So the newly created chair classifying robot. When this is on, then all your new search results will be automatically categorized using that classifier. I'm pressing the search button and here we have the search results. And here are the predictions of the classifier. So now the AI thinks that of these 50 documents, uh, four are folding chairs and two are rocking chairs. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, going back here, here's folding chair label. Yep, it seems to be a folding chair. Let's confirm it. And the next one, uh, the AI suggests that it's a rocking chair. Well, it has a pivoting mechanism, but this is not a rocking chair in the sense that I, I want like very grandma type uh, rocking chairs. Then I, I reject this. And, and this is how it uh, how it goes. This hit number 16 is already confirmed. That means that it's already in our uh, training set. So you immediately see that uh, this is already in, in our scope, uh, kind of this, this publication. And of course, if, for example, in this case, uh, I were like interested in this, these um, folding chairs, what I could do, I could immediately label this as, as my favorite and use the zoom to favorites function and iterate the search. And now when I iterate, iterated the search with one, even one folding chair uh, as my favorite, in the next iteration, I get 10 more folding chairs. So it's kind of a very quick iterative process where you use the intelligence provided by the classifiers your your manual input uh, with these favorites so you can really 
even with starting with a really, really generic search uh, query, you can really easy get on the right track with your search uh, by combining this, this, these methods. Okay, I'll develop this, this search case uh, a bit. Let's get back to the uh, original uh, results and I'm adding some features here. Uh, we talk about wheelchairs, so let's add wheels there. Let's tell that the support connecting uh, the the seat and the backrest. You see that I'm adding some connected information here, which uh, connected to support. This is really just to demonstrate the graph graph method. And uh, there are other purposes to define a chair that has wheels. Still a very, very generic chair, but still a chair having wheels. I'm, I'm rerunning the search. And now we see that uh, again, we, we get uh, some, some uh, predictions. And let's see how, how it worked. So in my first search result is, is a chair. And indeed, it seems to have wheels there, so it's a, it's a pretty good prior art hit as it uh, as it uh, should. Uh, the next uh, chair here, again, office chair having wheels. Uh, what's remarkable is that the wheels are are not even called wheels here; they are called casters. Plurality of casters. That was a new word for me when I when I uh, saw it. But anyway, meaning the same thing, and. Yeah, so these are good prior results, but they are not wheelchairs uh, in the sense that I uh, perceive wheelchairs. Now, here's the first wheelchair tag. Let's see what it is. Yes, it is actually a wheelchair in the sense that I want for, for elderly people. And uh, so immediately, again, my attention was drawn uh, to the right kind of technology, even my, if my search query was uh, was pretty pretty generic. And uh, this is kind of uh, hopefully, uh, if not proves, then at least supports my point uh, when when I started with the wheelchair uh, picture in the in in the presentation. So both. Uh, like technical detail or understanding for the prior art search purposes and and then the uh, looking at the world through through your your uh, lenses uh, is kind of combined nicely nicely here okay uh, if any questions feel free to post them i'll, uh, I'll, I'll anyway move to the uh, next uh, uh, demo case, which was the binary uh, classifier using the qubit gold standard set. Let's give this new collection a qubit uh, training set, it really doesn't matter. Again, an empty collection, and now I'm drag and dropping the qubit gold standard file here. It has two columns, publication number, and then a qubit or not column, which uh, has uh, either a qubit label or a no qubit label. If there are other physicists here, you know that quantum technologies is um, uh, in quantum technology, things can be in multiple states at the same time. But in this case, uh, it's, it's either or, either it's qubit or, or not qubit. Okay, jokes aside, like here, uh, I'm going to import. Again, it creates the qubit and no qubit labels on the fly because they didn't exist previously. And here we go, about 1,400 uh, documents uh, in these two, two categories. And again, we are good to go to train our second classifier, qubit. Uh, uh, let's call it the qubit detector because we want to detect if, if there are uh, qubit technology in, in, in question. And again, we get the metrics. So this is like a well over 90% uh, uh, 
accuracy classifier, the precision is, is really high, uh, 96%. The F1 score is uh, 91%, recall almost 90. Again, if you need to tune the uh, balance, uh, you can you can do it with, uh, with the slider. So anyway, really, really high quality uh, classifier created in, in a few seconds. Uh, let's apply this to some data. And for that, I have here a pre-created uh, collection, which contains, I think, something 700 uh, IBM's uh, quantum technology uh, patents. Uh, most of them are uh, like fresh, so not contained in the training set without any labels. And that's actually even impossible because the qubit uh, data set was created uh, like three or four years ago. And now this IBM's quantum technology seems to have emerged uh, like big time, uh, just like three years ago. So most of the documents are, are new to the Oops, sorry. Uh, new to the uh, algorithm anyway. So loading back the data set here. And yeah, now if my question is that what portion of IBM's uh, quantum patents are relating to this particular qubit technology, I just go to the actions menu, classify all with qubit detector. And here we go. Uh, 221 of, of the documents uh, seem to be relating to qubit technology and about 402 uh, or for about 400 to, to uh, not relate to qubit technology. And here, then, of course, depending on your, on your task, what you're doing, if you're in, into detail of analysis, then you could start going through the, uh, through the hits and, and seeing whether whether the predictions are right. If you want to do macro level analytics, I think the accuracy of the classifier should be at the level that that immediately gives you some insights. And then you could go to the actions menu, uh, export it uh, to, to Excel, import to Power BI or, or any other uh, visualization tool or your, or your st standard analytics platform and do the, do the analytics. Having said this, we are also building, uh, hopefully sooner than later, our own visualization model. And then it could look, look for example, something like this. For example, if you are, uh, have trained like a classifier for MEMS technology, you could, you could uh, easily uh, select the portfolios that you want to analyze, uh, the, the time span uh, covered, and then uh, easily get get um, uh, insights to those uh, companies portfolios like the like the uh, balance between uh, different technologies and and uh, what technologies are trending and, and so on many of you are much more experienced in in this level analytics than, than myself and you probably seen uh, many many tools or or even have have many many tools for uh, this and uh, currently, we are able to provide you very high quality data for this level analytics, and at some point we'll also provide the actual uh, visualizations. Uh, another uh, place where you can uh, apply uh, the uh, classifiers soon will be uh, the monitoring profiles. Let's say that I'm now I'm doing a uh, number search or an invalidated type search for uh, uh, related uh, patent. This is somehow in the, uh, okay, I had the chair classifiers active and we get zero predictions naturally. So let's classify this set with the Qubit uh, detector. So now uh, 30, of these documents seem to be uh, related to uh, qubit, one clearly to the no, no qubit class, and it seems that uh, the rest are so distant that it, it didn't even uh, give, give the uh, classes. And if you would 
now want to continue monitoring uh, this kind of technology you could launch a monitoring profile uh, in in, in IP rally and soon you will be able to connect uh, these classifiers to your monitoring profiles so whenever you get uh, monitoring results uh, they would be automatically uh, categorized and even uh, like automatically redirected uh, to the relevant people this is now a mock of that something like this the future uh, monitoring mod module uh, could look like and uh, this further development is of course something that we want to get uh, input from our users so we really uh, want to have as many of you as, as uh, possible uh, trialing the system and and hopefully also using it uh, in your in your workflows and giving us feedback and telling what what would be the most uh, useful features but as mentioned already now we can provide you the data and we can provide it pretty pretty fast yeah there would be many uh, other things to show and discuss about but i think we are uh, running out of time i think we still have nine minutes so i'll stop the uh, demo and yeah maybe give the floor back to andreas yeah uh, thank you zachary uh, i've been collecting some uh, some questions here uh, so i think we can uh, we can just jump into that uh, very quickly and uh, see if we can answer some of that um they keep disappearing for me though so let's let's try again so i think uh some of the common questions we're, we're getting is uh, relating to the amount of data required and how that relates to the scope and sort of the granularity of of the different classes uh, any general uh feedback on that question yeah yeah, you, you, you're right. Of course, it depends on the granularity. So if you're dealing with with technical nuances or very, very uh, small differences, then then more training data uh, will, will be needed. Uh, when we have done the, the uh, pilots, uh, kind of the rule of thumb or our hunch is that 100 documents per category with the taxonomies that we have seen, is, is usually enough so so with that le level of data you could should be able to pro build a classifier that uh, provides like uh, results that are hel helpful in everyday life uh, but if you don't have that much data then i think get started with 10 or, or 20 what you have and, and keep improving as you saw when you get start using it you get more predictions it's it's quite fast to Im improve the data set and, and uh, build a better classifier but the you can use 5,000 if you happen to have a historical database of 5,000, then why, why not just import it? Yeah, perfect. And then uh, another question that came up a couple of times was relating to hierarchical structures and, and sort of multi-tiered uh, classes. Um, do, can, can we do that uh, in the platform? Yeah, uh, technically we can uh in the on the ua level as, as you saw the cover our in the tax section there it's still like a flat hierarchy but if you have a uh hierarchical taxonomy then just use the leaf uh kind of uh classes to be uh, train the uh, train the classifier you can then always like back calculate the the hierarchy uh having said this uh we hear this like wish or question so often that i'm pretty sure that we'll build the hierarchy also into the system quite soon mm. yeah and then another question is a fairly tactical question um and i no i'll skip that i think you you showed it actually but um an important question is so the, the the AI learns from classification within the the specific classifier in the in the projects, but do we also track and, and record user behaviors and uh, how things are classified for a general AI, or are those two things separate? 
yeah uh, so currently if you import any any data to ip rally or add tags uh, there it is stored to your like your organizations or your accounts sphere uh, and and we don't use that data to to uh, train our general ai model or and we don't use uh, that data for any other purposes than than showing you the classes and if you so wish to train those classifier robots uh, for you so it's 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 really safe and it's completely controlled by you if you delete the tax there then they're gone mm. yeah and then a two-part question i think um, just trying to to combine some things some things on the fly here so let's see if we can make it work but um the question is do, do we use all the content in the patent for this purpose or can you control what you're looking for can you use you know title abstract claims for example instead of the full text and then the second part of that question is when we do the classification do we look at other things than sort of the graph and the, the trained mm. data that we have do we look at ipcs or or anything else uh, to to guide it yeah uh, uh quite quite relevant question and the answer is that currently we use the full specification graph because that contains the the most detail level information uh, the, the patent has uh but we could do the same uh, just for the claims for example or at some point also just for the independent claims or abstracts uh, that's one of the things where we would really like to hear uh, some some like insights from the users that in which use cases would you would you look into into uh, different places and so on but the full specification is clearly the best starting point because it contains usually all, all the information to the second part uh now we are just using the graphs so so the technical content of the of the patents but of course uh if it's helpful to combine some ipc cpc inventor uh, filing date whatever uh, information uh, to the classifiers to get better results then of course that would be useful and actually that is something that that uh, our, our ai team is uh, investigating already this year that, that whether combining uh, more data will yield better results but okay. Actually, actually, it's. I, I would guess that it does. Just a guess, but uh, actually, I think it's pretty promising that we, with ju just the technical content. Uh, so the most difficult problem, uh, almost, we we get uh, uh, this level of results. Yeah, there are more questions as well, uh, but I think in the interest of time and just to to make sure we can wrap up uh, on time. Uh, we will park those questions now and then we will get back to you both individually and then uh, try to collate like a q a document to to everyone uh from this session and and the previous one so. yeah one last ad uh Kone is, is one of the companies that we have been uh collaborating with while, while developing this and doing both offline classification and and self-service classification and they have found that uh, it, it really uh, even works magically well re reduced working hours and improved consistency and and we expect to hear uh, these kind of text testimonials uh, more uh, as, as, as we go and get more more users on board yeah absolutely there's one more slide as well right we can skip the poll I guess, but um, yeah, so we're, we're, you know, ideally hoping to hear that kind of feedback from you as well at, at some point, if you're attending the session. So, and there were some questions about whether this can be, can be tested and we offer trials of it. And yes, we do. Um, so if you want to sign up and, and try to, to break this, uh, we, we welcome that. Um, so you will get a, uh, an email uh, following up, uh, sending you the recording of this if you want to share it or rewatch it. Uh, but there's also going to be a link to uh, to signing up to, to a free trial. Uh, so we'll support you throughout that, guide you through you know best practice and, and how to use it, even if it's fairly intuitive. Um, but yeah, uh, reach out to us if you have any questions or if you want to if you want to test it um 
we're looking forward to to supporting you. So I think that's that's really it uh, for this. I think we're right on time, and uh, we really appreciate you know all of your time and your interest and all the great questions. And uh, we hope to uh, to continue the conversation in uh, different shapes or forms as well. So good good evening and or have a great rest of the day. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.